Now, that brings us to the third chapter of this very marvelous book. And I'm just going to get my foot in the door here, but let's go back and take a look at our timetable. And remember, a timetable, three things are important. The destination of the plane or train. You better get on the right one. And then the time it leaves and the time it arrives. Well, chapter 1, his destination is Nineveh. He leaves Israel, arrives in the fish. Chapter 2 that we looked at, his destination is still Nineveh. He leaves the fish. He arrives on the dry land. Now we've come to chapter 3. His destination is still Nineveh. He leaves the dry land, and he's going to arrive in Nineveh. And this brings us now to this third chapter. Verse 1, and I'm reading. And the word of the Lord came unto Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go unto Nineveh, that great city, and preach unto it the preaching that I bid thee. Now, I'll have time for only one thing to mention, and next time we're going to come back to this verse here. And that is, the important thing is, the word of the Lord came unto Jonah the second time. I was teaching the book of Jonah many years ago at a summer conference, and there was a school teacher there attending it, and she's a lovely person. But she always, after every session, would come down with a question. And school teachers could always ask me questions that I couldn't answer. And she came down one day with this one. She said, suppose that Jonah after he got out of the fish, went back to Joppa and bought another ticket to go to Tarshish. What would have happened? Well, you know, I'd never heard it from that viewpoint before. And I said to the teacher, the best thing I could say, and I don't think I've changed my mind since then, I think there'd been a second fish waiting for him out there. But it wasn't necessary because he's already learned his lesson. He's going to Nineveh, friend. No question about that. That's where he's headed now. And the ticket he buys, he buys a train ticket or a plane ticket or some kind of ticket. He's going to Nineveh, and he's headed in that direction, the same as the prodigal son. Suppose that boy had said the next year to his dad, Dad, stake me again. I'm going to the far country. Do you think the father would have staked him? I think he would have. But the interesting thing is, boy didn't go to the far country. Why? Because he's a son of the father, and he didn't want to get in a pig pen again. God's children may get into sin, but they're sure not going to live in sin. And if they're going to live in sin, it's just like pigs. Pigs live in pig pens. Sons live in the father's house. And it's just that simple, friend, and just that important. Now, the word of the Lord came unto Jonah the second time. And that teacher asked me that question about what would have happened if he'd have headed for Tarshish on a second trip. Well, all I can say is there'd been another fish out there because this man's going to go to Nineveh. But he's already learned his lesson. And maybe this school teacher was having trouble with her pupils not learning. But God's pupils, his children, will learn the lessons. Now we're going to see the meaning of that word, the second time, that phrase, the second time. And that has become to some people that have listened to the book of Jonah has become the most meaningful statement there is in the Scripture. And I hope it may be that to you next time, because many folk need this today. So until next time, may God richly bless you, my beloved. Now, in this third chapter, we have here a verse that I would like to write over it that I feel like is rather important, and it's this, "...far as Jonas was a sign unto the Ninevites, so shall also the Son of Man be to this generation." Now, that's what the Lord Jesus said in his day. Then, back over the chapter we've just finished, chapter 2, I would write Matthew 12:39 and 40. When you listen to this, 
he answered and said unto them, An evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign. There shall no sign be given to it but the sign of the prophet Jonas. For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the fish's belly, so shall also the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Now, I think the analogy here that our Lord is drawing makes it of necessity to say that Jonah was not alive for a comfortable weekend in a fish tail instead of a motel or a hotel, but he was actually dead inside of the fish. And I trust that the language of the second chapter was impressive enough to you that this man is not describing a comfortable weekend at all, but the awful agony he went through before he lapsed into unconsciousness and then death. Now, God's going to give this prophet a second chance. We read last time, the word of the Lord came unto Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go unto Nineveh, that great city, and preach unto it the preaching that I bid thee. Now, our God is the God of the second chance. I have since renamed this chapter 3, the God of the second chance. What a marvelous, wonderful thing that is. Now, only God will give you a second chance, and he'll give you more than that. I do not know how far up or down the ladder I'm working, but I know he's given me a dozen different chances, and I think that he's long-suffering and patient. He's not willing that any should perish. If you're his child, he's going to hold on to you. You may be sure of that. So Jonah now gets the call the second time. Some of the great corporations today... I don't believe would give a man a second chance. I do not know whether General Motors would, or Standard Oil Company, or General Foods. I have a notion that they would not give him a second chance. Years ago here in California, there was one of the vice presidents, and I understand he was the first vice president of the Bank of America, which is a tremendous bank. And he's a very wonderful Christian. He was a very personal friend of mine. In fact, he married my secretary when I was pastor in downtown Los Angeles. And I asked him one time, I said, suppose in one of your branches of your bank, you had a manager there that absconded with all of the funds and that he disappeared, went down to South America or someplace. And then after a few years, he came back and he asked to be forgiven and be restored and given another chance. Would you give him a job? He said, no, he's through. They wouldn't give him another chance. He's had it. And isn't it wonderful that God gives us a second chance? The word of the Lord came unto Jonah the second time. Now, this is not just something unusual that God did in Jonah's case. He's not making an exception of Jonah at all. You remember, Father, back in the Old Testament in Genesis, the story of Jacob? Jacob failed again and again and again and again until he actually became a disgrace to God. And he was a source of embarrassment to him. But God never let him go. You remember that? He was a trickster. He was clever. Tried to live by his own ability. And even when he got down there with his father-in-law, his father-in-law was smarter than he was and put it over on him. But he did what he could, and he did pretty well. And he had to flee and leave and get away from there. And he had antagonized his father-in-law and also his brother, Esau because of his conduct, but he can't keep on like that because he is God's man. And he did want to serve God, but my, what a pour out he made of it. And as far as I'm concerned, I'd have got rid of him if I'd been the Lord and get somebody else. But God didn't do that. You remember it? Peniel. 
when he came back to the land. That night, God wrestled with him. You hear some time of the fact that Jacob wrestled with God. Jacob didn't wrestle with God, friends. That night, with his father-in-law back of him, his brother ahead of him, and both of them wishing that Jacob was dead and would be very glad to be the instrument to end his life, you may be sure of one thing, Jacob's not looking for another wrestling match. He's got enough problems on his hands, and he's not about to do any wrestling. It's God that wrestled with him at Peniel. And you remember that man had to learn something that night. God crippled him before he got him. And then Jacob saw that he was losing, and he just finally just held on and asked for a blessing. And from that day on, he's a different man, and he's changed. And down there in Egypt, when he met his grandchildren, Joseph's sons, why, a grandpa's inclined to boast just a little. I'm a grandfather. You know, you like for your grandson to think well of you. But this is the thing that old Jacob said. He didn't tell him how smart he was and how clever he was and how he put it over on Esau, how he put it over on his uncle Laban. No, he didn't say that. This is what he did say. He said, may the Lord that kept me from evil keep the lads. What a change has come over him now. How humble he is. He's now resting in God. He's a different man. And then there's David. Even today, there are great many, especially sinners, some of these evil old men, these dirty old men today that used to come in to my service. And one of them with a leer in his eyes and a sneer in his voice, he said to me, why was it God said that David was a man after his own heart? Well, I said, what you're trying to say is David committed murder and adultery and that God said that because he did that? Is that what you're trying to say? Well, he says, it looks like it. Well, I said, then you just haven't read the record at all. I said, David committed an awful sin and God punished him for it. Actually, God took him to the woodshed and whipped him in an inch of his life. And as far as I'm concerned, when I see what happened to David, and finally his heart was broken when that son of his, Absalom, was slain. That's the boy he wanted to be king, and he betrayed him. He led a rebellion against him. And then he was slain, murdered. And David, how he wept. Oh, he says, oh, Absalom, my son Absalom, would to God have died in your stead. Why? Because... David didn't feel like that boy knew God at all. And so David was heartbroken the rest of his life. God punished him because of his sin. But God forgave David when David came to him and said, Restore unto me, not his salvation, but the joy of my salvation. And I said to this old man that came down with that sneer in his voice, I said, Look, I said, you know, you ought to be very glad that God said David was a man after his own heart because of his relationship with God. Because if God will save a man like David, he might save you and he might save me. And I said, you ought to be thankful he's that kind of a God. He gave David a second chance, and he'll give you a second chance and a third chance. And I read a letter this party have slipped and fell, and then she came back to the Lord. And she's come back, and God will receive when you come back. And then take another man. That was Simon Peter. He stumbled and fell, got himself dirty, but he got up and started all over again. You'll recall that he denied Christ and looked through that judgment hall and he saw, I think he caught the eyes of the Lord Jesus, not eyes looking at him in anger, but in pity and in mercy. And he went out and wept. And when our Lord came back from the dead, he peered to Simon Peter privately. Why? So Simon Peter could get that straightened out. And friends, if you're a child of God, get in sin. You can come back to him, but you better mean business. You better be sincere. 
and you can handle it very privately with him. You can go to him and tell him, and you can tell him what you can tell no one else, and he'll accept you and receive you. He's the God of the second chance. And then there's another man that failed, John Mark. He wasn't much of a missionary at first. In fact, he was chicken. He turned and went back. I heard of a man that said that the reason that he didn't fly, didn't go by plane, was because he had back trouble. man said, well, what kind of back trouble do you have? He says, I got a yellow streak up and down my back. That's my problem. Well, John Mark had a yellow streak up and down his back. He was chicken. And he turned and went back on the first missionary journey. But good old Barnabas wanted to forgive him and take him on the second missionary journey. Paul said, I won't take him again. I'm through with him. Anyone that turns as that boy did and runs home to mama, I'm not about to take him with me on a missionary journey. But Paul had to change his mind because God will receive, and God did receive this man. And when Paul wrote Second Timothy, his swan song, he says, bring John Mark with you. He's profitable to me for the ministry. He made good. Aren't you glad God gives you a second chance? And then let me give one other illustration, one not in the Bible, one very much up to date. Years ago, here in Southern California, I was on an evening program at 9 o'clock at night. And on that program, I taught the book of Jonah, just as I'm teaching it here. And I enlarged, as I'm doing now, on verse 1 of chapter 3. Well, in the next day or two, I got a letter from a medical doctor in Beverly Hills, California. And he wrote a rather lengthy letter, and he said to me, he said, I want you to know that that verse, verse 1 of chapter 3 of Jonah, is now the most important verse in the Bible to me. He says, when you said he's the God of the second chance, I came back to him. Because he said, and he told me then the story in this letter, he said that he had come from Chicago, He'd been a prominent doctor there, also an officer in the church, and problems arose in the church. And he was blamed for the problem. He was not guilty. He declares he was not guilty at all. That fact, he wasn't involved in it. I think it involved the handling of funds and property, and he was blamed for it. He was not guilty. But he became bitter, and he actually left the Chicago area and came to California and established his practice here, but never would darken the door of a church. He said that he'd never been inside of a church, but he did listen to me on the radio. And when I said that he's the God of the second chance and the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time, he said that was just like a drink to a man that was out on the desert dying of thirst. He said, that meant more to me than anything. Well, I sat down and wrote that man a letter, and I did what a preacher, I guess, would do. I urged him to get into a church and get busy again for the Lord. And he wrote me back and said, I'm already back in the church, and I'm already busy for the Lord again. He's the God of the second chance, friends. We have a wonderful God. Now, this is an illustration of how he treats his children. When they sin, they come back. The prodigal son, he came home, you remember? (laughs) When he came home, he didn't get a beating. He got a banquet. He didn't get kicked around. He got kisses. There was a fatted calf instead of the poor boy being put out of the house and rejected. The father took the boy back. How wonderful it is. Now we're going to see how gracious God is to a sinful city. And this is, I suppose, one of the greatest records of a revival. That is what we call a revival of people turning to God that there is anywhere, including the Bible. May I say to you what happened here in Nineveh makes the day of Pentecost look very small because there were a few thousand there 
there were several hundred thousand in the city of Nineveh that turned to God. And this all happened before the church got here. And the greatest revival will take place after the church leaves the earth. You see, God's not just dependent on the church. Today, he's calling the people out of every tribe, tongue, and nation. And that's the reason we're trying to get the word out today is because we believe we're coming to the end of the age and God wants the word to go out that everyone might hear. But the great revival, the great turning to God is yet in the future. And this story here of Nineveh is just a small adumbration of that. Now, will you notice God gives him a commission to arise and go to Nineveh, that great city, and preach unto it the preaching that I bid thee. Now, I'm going to have to stop and say a word about Nineveh being that great city. It was great in wickedness, but geographically, it was a very large city also. Now, we have been told before that this city of Nineveh was a great city. And the last verse of the book of Jonah says, "...should I not spare Nineveh that great city?" And it was a great city. And the reason is quite obvious now. And it's because they found out, the archaeologists has found out a great deal about this city. Actually, the critic criticized the book of Jonah on many counts, and one of them was the fact that again and again, it says three times in the book of Jonah, Nineveh was the great city, an exceeding great city. Well, they were great in sin, to be sure, but they were also a very large city. And nothing was known about this place until over a hundred years ago. In 1845, Layard, the Frenchman, he was really the first one that examined the ruins. He and George Smith excavated the ancient city of Nineveh. Nineveh proper, that is, the tail of Nineveh, was across the Tigris from the modern city of Mosul. And it was built in the shape of a trapezium. That is, it was about two and a half miles in length and a mile and a third in brink. Well, that would make it a pretty good-sized place. But I very frankly would say that that does not meet the demands of the book of Jonah. But you see, Nineveh lies in a plain along the Tigris River. And in fact, it was entirely surrounded by rivers and was very easily fortified. There were several prominent cities in this natural enclosure. And the closure was this, that the Tigris River came along and there ran into it the upper Sab River. And it formed a V-shaped valley between the two rivers. And then across the top of them, the north, there was a range of mountains. And this entire area had natural fortifications, that is, the rivers and also the mountains. And there were three great cities that were built there. Now, Nineveh was up on the Tigris River and down at the forks of the river, that is, where the upper Zab flowed in, there was Kala, or it's called in Scripture ancient Nimrod. And it was 18 miles southeast of Nineveh proper. And it was, as we've said, near the juncture of the river Zab, right where it flows into the Tigris. Now, the city of Cala was 12 miles to the east on the upper Zab River, as Nineveh was on the Tigris River. And they were all in this natural enclosure here. Now, this entire group of cities were known as Nineveh. Actually, Cala was probably the first city, and then Corsabad, and then Nineveh. And Nineveh became, therefore, the great city, and all that area was named for it. 
And it's quite interesting that when you go back to the book of Genesis, to the 10th chapter, verses 11 and 12, you read this. It says, "...out of that land went forth Asher, and builded Nineveh, and the city of Rehoboth, and Cala, and Rezin, between Nineveh and Cala." The same is a great city. So that the Word of God all the way through emphasizes the greatness of this city. Now, it's all given the name Nineveh since Nineveh became the capital of it. And one of the ancient writers, Cetesius, he describes Nineveh as a city whose circuit is 480 stadia. This would mean that it was over 27 miles around the city. And that's well to keep in mind now when we see Jonah beginning his ministry in that great city. Now, this gives you some conception of its size. Now, that's always reminded me of Southern California. As we said last time, they call it the greater Los Angeles area. In it, I think they say now about 27 separate municipalities. They're urban areas. Some of them are not much more than a big shopping area, but some of them are pretty good-sized shopping areas. And we live in one of them here. Pasadena is just about 10 miles by freeway down into downtown Los Angeles. And it's part of this great metropolitan area. Now, you have that same thing that took place in Nineveh in that day. Now, we are told something here that it's a great city. And as we've said before, great in size and great in wickedness. Now, this city was guilty of those same sins that caused God, as we've seen in the other prophets. We saw it in the book of Amos and Hosea that the reason God destroyed these great cities was, first of all, because of their luxury and sex, gross immorality, and then because of the type of music they had, and then because of drink. There were those that were alcoholics in that day, many of them. Now, that was the same thing that could be said of this city here, given over to idolatry, brutal, their cruelty and brutality to the enemy is absolutely unspeakable. And this led, of course, to gross immorality in the city. It was a city of wine and women, the bottle and the brothel, sauce and sex. That was the thing that identified the great city of Nineveh. But it's into this great city now that this man, Jonah, is called to go and minister. Now I read in verse 3, "...so Jonah arose and went into Nineveh according to the word of the Lord." You notice he's doing things now according to the word of the Lord. He started to Tarshish, which was not according to the word of the Lord. Now he's going to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now, here we have it again. Now, Nineveh was an exceeding great city of three days' journey. This is, of course, the statement that caused the critic to laugh and to ridicule. Well, the fact of the matter is, as we've explained, why it was a city that would take you several hours to just go through one of these cities. But you have three of them there, and then a great urban area, where there were a great population in this area, estimated at several million, of course. And it's into this area that Jonah is coming now. And it was an exceeding great city of three days' journey. And we're told in verse 4, "...and Jonah..." began to enter into the city a day's journey, and he cried and said, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. The whole point is that it took him quite a while to cover the ground. He didn't have radio then, didn't have a loudspeaker, 
And I've often wondered how he did it. And I like to bring these incidents right down to reality. And if you can't get the Word of God right down where the rubber meets the road, it's no good, friends. And I thought that area being very similar to Southern California. We live here in a place called Pasadena. Some of you are acquainted with Southern California. Down about 25 miles, it's Long Beach. That takes you down to the ocean. And that would be going south. Or I can go west and go another about 20 miles. And I get to the ocean there in Santa Monica. It's because it makes quite a turn, actually. The coastline here is not really running north and south. It's running almost east and west. doesn't seem that way sometimes, but it is. And the fact of the matter is that suppose I started out, and I've tried to visualize this. Suppose I tried to start it out walking. And Jonah, by the way, didn't have a car. And he would stop at a street corner, a busy intersection, and he'd give his message. Then he'd walk on down to another intersection while he's waiting for the light to change. He'd speak to another crowd. Now, somebody is going to say, how did he get a crowd? Now, this is always a problem for the preacher. We try our best to get as many people in to hear the Word. We try to do that on radio. We want as many people as possible to hear the Word of God. That's natural, normal. How did Jonah do it? And he used a method that's a little different than any we could use today. Now, if you will recall, when I gave the illustrations of the man who had been swallowed by a fish and lived to tell the story, and the late Dr. Harry Rimmer told about seeing this man that had spent two days and two nights inside of a fish, lived to tell the story, and he was on display in London, and call a Jonah of the 20th century. Dr. Rimmer went in to see him. In fact, he interviewed the man and had quite a talk with him. And this was two years after it happened. And this man didn't have a hair on his body. And his skin was a sort of a brownish, purplish color. You see the gastric juices of the fish reacting upon the individual trying to digest him. And these chemicals are bound to have quite an effect upon you. And that was the thing that apparently happened to Jonah. This fish trying to digest him, he's putting out all kinds of juices and chemicals to try to digest Jonah. And you can imagine the color of this man's skin. You can imagine how he looked. And when he stopped at a corner and the crowd gathered... They said, Brother, where have you been? He told them. He said, I'm a man from the dead. A fish swallowed me. God had sent me to Nineveh. And people didn't ridicule the story. They listened. Sometimes the sinner listens. I'm told in Russia today that it's probably the only place where there's a real moving of the Spirit of God out through the rural areas that the great company of people have turned to the Lord. Real moving of the Spirit of God, friends, in places today that you wouldn't believe it. And who would have thought that in the wicked city of Nineveh that people would listen to the Word of God? But here comes a man and he says, I'm back from the dead. By the way, that's the same message we got. We have a story about a man who came back from the dead And he died for our sins. He was delivered for our offenses and raised for our justification. And so Jonah enters into the city. And now will you notice something that is quite remarkable? We're told here that his message was a message of judgment. For today's none of us to be destroyed. And Jonah, I think, gave that message with relish. He didn't like Ninevites. Now verse 5. So the people of Nineveh believed God. Now, friends, that's a marvelous statement in the Old Testament. Did you know that's all God's ever asked any person to do, any sinner to do is just believe him? (laughs) What does he ask you to believe? 
believe what he's done for you. Believe that Christ died for you, died for you, for your sin. Believe that he was raised again and that he's at God's right hand. The people of Nineveh, they believed God. That's the important thing today. I'm afraid that we have, even in our churches, many people, their business termites. And they take all these little courses, and they talk about the Bible. But I asked a man the other day that's that type of an individual. He goes to everything that comes along. And I got so tired of hearing him tell about where he's been and the great things he's seen. And he's done very little, but he tells about the great meetings he attends. And I asked him point blank the question. I said, do you believe God? And he looked me straight in the eye, and he thought a minute. And he said, well, I think I do. May I say, may I tell you, all of this worked for nothing because he does not really believe God. People in Nineveh believe God, and they proclaimed a fast. They demonstrated it, you see. Faith always leads to works. And they put on sackcloth from the greatest of them even to the least of them. For word came unto the king of Nineveh, and he rose from his throne He laid his robe from him and covered himself with cloth and sat in ashes. Now, I want to tell you, friends, when people start doing that, they're not committing sin. They are in deep repentance before God and are asking God for mercy. And when you ask God for mercy, you're going to find out that he's merciful. Now, will you notice this? And he caused it to be proclaimed and published through Nineveh, by the decree of the king and his nobles, saying, Let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them not feed nor even drink water. These people have been alcoholics. Now they're told they're not even to drink water. And let not man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily unto God. Each one to cry mightily to God. Yea, let them turn every one from his evil way. You've got to turn from sin, friends. If you come to Christ, and you can come just like you are, but when you come, you have turned from sin. You couldn't possibly accept him and not turn from sin. And every one turn from his evil way and from the violence that's in their hands. These were a brutal people, violent people. They were given to riots. They were given to cruelty and brutality and mob rule. And now the king says, turn from all of that and cry to God and cry to God for mercy. And the strangest thing happened, and I don't think Jonah was too enthusiastic. In fact, he was not, as we will probably be able to see today. And the thing is that the whole city turned to God. That was remarkable. In fact, it was something that is quite amazing. It is said that even from the king on the throne to the peasant in the hovel, they all turned to the Lord and cried mightily to God. And they believed God. What a glorious, wonderful time this was. Now, we're hearing today that we're having revival in certain places. I've been around to some of these places where they claim they're having revival. Well, I don't think that you could quite call what's taking place, certainly in this country today, revival anywhere. I think that we see a great moving of the Spirit of God in certain places, and I believe always where the Word of God is preached and taught that you see a moving of the Spirit of God. But I don't think that you're seeing revival, a great moving today. The church, and when I say the church, I mean you and I mean me. I mean all of us that are believers today, regardless of what group we're identified with or what local assembly we go to, that we find that actually the church is quite inactive as far as really winning people to Christ today and getting the Word out and building them up in the faith. Now, someone sent me this because of a statement I made some time ago about the fact that there's so many church members today that are 
not saved. And they sent me this little gimmick, and I'm glad to get it. Here it is. Church members are either pillars or caterpillars. The pillars hold up the church. The caterpillars just crawl in and out. And I think that's good, friends, and I'm sure glad to get that. That is the problem today. We've got too many caterpillars and not enough pillars to hold up the church. Now, this one man goes into this city, and the entire city turns to God. This is just something that never happened before, as far as I know, and certainly Noah didn't have this kind of an experience. But this man Jonah did. Now, notice the reaction to it. The city turned to God, believed God, and the king sent out a decree. And in verse 9 of chapter 3, I begin reading. Who can tell if God will turn and repent and turn away from his fierce anger that we perish not? And God saw their works, that they turned from their evil way, and God repented of the evil he said that he would do unto them, and he did it not. Now we've come to what is probably the strongest statement of all about God repenting. What does it mean when it says in Scripture that God repented? Does God repent? Well, the word repentance in both the Old and New Testaments, in the Old Testament and the Septuagint, which is a Greek translation, and one of our better manuscripts, by the way, of the Old Testament, the word is metanoison. It means to change your mind. And the question arises, does God change his mind? What does it mean when it says that God repented? When one of the attributes of God is that he is immutable, that means God never changes. There's no reason for God to change. He knew the end from the beginning. And when this morning the Los Angeles Times came out, they didn't tell God a thing. May I say to you, God hasn't learned anything from our politicians and from our colleges today. They haven't taught God anything. God knew the end from the beginning. And there's no reason for God to change his mind because, after all, he's carrying on the program that he carries on and that he's outlined at the beginning, and he's just following through on it. Therefore, God does not change. But it says God repents. Now, will you listen for just a few moments? There are expressions used in the Word of God that are called anthropomorphic terms. That's a pretty big word. And this lady I read says, I teach simply. Well, I'm going to try to sort of break this word down and let's look at it. What does it mean when anthropomorphic terms are used in the Bible? Well, it means that there are certain attributes that belong to man that are ascribed to God. In the Bible, there are physical attributes and there are psychological attributes of man that are attributed to God. First of all, look at the physical attributes. It says in the Scripture that the eyes of the Lord run to and fro in the earth. Now, what does that mean? Does it mean God's got eyes like I've got? And if he has, are they blue or brown or what are they? Gray? Well, may I say to you, God doesn't have eyes, physical eyes, like I have. God is a spirit, and therefore he doesn't have eyes like we have, but the one who made the eye can see, and he can see without the eye. So that that's a little difficult for me, and the Lord knew that Vernon McGee would have problem understanding So he said, the eyes of the Lord run to and fro in the earth. And I understand that now. That means God sees everything. And that is an anthropomorphic term, ascribing to God an attribute that belongs to man so we can understand. Now it speaks of the arm of the Lord and the hand of the Lord. And that 
is very helpful to me, but the one who made my hand, my arm, he doesn't have a hand and arm like I've got. God is a spirit. But it says that the heavens are his handiwork, and it really means finger work. And that tells me something. John Wesley put it like this. God created the heavens and the earth, and he didn't even half try. Well, friends, finger work, that's like a woman crocheting, like knitting. That doesn't require a great deal of muscle. You don't have to do setting up exercises for six months before you can learn to knit, my friends. Well, God created the heavens and the earth, and we told it's his finger work. But when you're talking about God's salvation, his redemption, Isaiah says, to whom is the bared arm of the Lord revealed? And I understand now what I wouldn't understand before, that it costs God more. And it was more difficult for him to redeem man than it was to create a universe. So these are anthropomorphic terms that are used. Now there's certain psychological terms. It speaks of the anger of the Lord. Does God get angry? He sure does. He says he's angry with the wicked all the time. May I say to you that God today can get angry, but his anger is not like mine. I get angry when I hear that somebody said something about me. That doesn't bother God at all. His is not peevish or petulant. God's anger is an anger that is against all wickedness and sin. And then God loves, and I understand that. And in fact, God takes very, very human relationships, the love of a man for a woman. And you'll find that told in the little book of Ruth, and you'll find God again and again. And the church is called the bride of Christ. That tells us something. It tells us something of the love of God. God loves you. And you couldn't keep him from loving you. But now, here's another one. God repents. Well, that means changes his mind. That's what it means when it applies to me. When I repent, it means that I've changed my mind. I did this wrong. Now I see it's wrong, and I turn from it. And I go to God and ask for forgiveness for it. I come over on God's side. And that's what it means to confess your sin. You come over and agree with God about it. Now, does God repent like that? Does he change his mind? He says, my, I made a mistake there. I shouldn't have destroyed Nineveh. No, there are two things to note here. And will you note them? The city of Nineveh had two options when this man, Jonah, entered the city. They could reject God's message. They could ignore it. They could pay no attention to it. And if they did, they would be destroyed. God never changed that. But they could accept God's message. They could turn to God, which they did, and God would deliver and save them. Because God is immutable. He never changes. When his word is rejected, when people turn from him, they're lost. And when they turn to him, he'll always save them regardless of who they are. May I say to you, therefore, who changed? Did God change? No, it looked like he did. Because Jonah said, why, in 40 days this city's going to be destroyed. God's going to destroy it. But God didn't destroy it. Did God break his word? No, sir. God's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And that city had two options. If they didn't accept it, they would have been destroyed. But they accepted God's message. They believed God. They turned from their wickedness. And God didn't change. God always will save when people will turn to him. It looked like he did. And that is the way these poor pagan people there in the city of Nineveh. And unfortunately, we've got a lot of poor pagans around today that like to criticize the Bible. When you come to this, they say, look, it says God repented. My friend, it did look like he repented, but it would pay you to study this and find out who really changed. God didn't change, but the city of Nineveh changed, and it made all the difference in the world. Now, that brings us, friends, to the last chapter.
And the last chapter, even in this little book, looks like it's an addendum. Because, frankly, when you get to the end of the third chapter, you could write over it, Mission Impossible Accomplished. It's been accomplished. But the problem now is not Nineveh. The problem now is Jonah. Jonah was a problem child. And God had more trouble with a backsliding prophet by the name of Jonah than he had with an entire city of brutal, cruel, pagan sinners. And you know, I still think that's true. I think God is having more problems in Los Angeles with Christians than he's having with the unsaved world. And if you knew Los Angeles like I know Los Angeles, I think you'd agree with me. May I say to you, God's going to have a problem now. And I come to the last chapter, chapter 4. This man has a new destination. He's going to leave Nineveh, and he's glad to get out of town. His destination now is a gourd vine, and I should say a trailer court outside the city. Somebody's going to say to me, there's no trailer courts in that day. How do you know there were not any trailer courts in that day? Jonah went out. And he got him a little spot out yonder where he could camp, where he could park his camper. Now he leaves Nineveh. He goes outside of the city, and that is his destination. And he's waiting for God to destroy the city. And where is he going to arrive now? He's going to arrive in the heart of God. And I just don't know a better place for anybody to arrive than in the heart of God. And this prophet is going to arrive there. Now, God is going to seek to win over Jonah. And this chapter is going to demonstrate to us the fact that God will never interfere with your free will. My friend, he's not going to force you on any issue whatsoever. You are a free moral agent. Actually, he's moved heaven and hell and came by the way of a cross and he knocks at your heart's door. And friends, he doesn't come any farther than that until that door is opened, and it has to be opened from the inside. He'll never crash the door. He'll never push it in. He'll never come in uninvited. So he's going to have to deal with a backsliding prophet who has a pretty strong will, who hates Ninevites, and he's going to try to win Jonah over to God's viewpoint. Now, the mission is accomplished. As we saw here at the very beginning, I arranged it according to a timetable, each chapter. And the man had left Israel, the northern kingdom, probably Gath Hefer, his hometown. And his destination is Nineveh. And it took him three chapters to get there, and he accomplished his mission, and the entire city turns to God. Now, the book ought to end, but no, God has to win the prophet over. And in chapter 4, we have the destination as a little trailer court outside of Nineveh. He leaves Nineveh, not going to it anymore, but leaving it, and he arrives in the heart of God. Now, if... I had had the privilege of being the one that brought the message to Nineveh and have seen the result that he did. I believe that I would have gone down to Western Union and sent a telegram back to my hometown or back to my home and tell people what had happened and cause them to praise and thank God for what had been accomplished. I'd rejoice in it. But that's because of I'm where I am and under altogether different circumstances. Because if I'd been in Jonah's shoes and certainly in Jonah's fish, I might have had the same feeling that he did. Because this is something that seems unbelievable. Fact of the matter is, I have no problem with the fish. I have a lot of problem with Jonah. As you well know, at the very beginning, he's called to go one direction, he heads the other direction. I don't understand that. I guess until I look at my own heart and I found out that I've headed the wrong direction several times when it was very clear God wanted me to go the opposite direction.
Now, will you notice, chapter 4 opens with this unbelievable verse. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was very angry. Now, it didn't displease him just a little bit, but it displeased him exceedingly. And he wasn't just angry a little bit. He was very angry. This man is angry about what? He's angry because the city of Nineveh has turned to God. And he didn't like that. Now, will you notice verse 2? And he prayed unto the Lord. Now, the last time he prayed, he was inside the fish. Now, here he is outside of Nineveh. And he's up there in a little trailer court. His camper is parked there, and he sits in the shade of it. And he prays. He's very unhappy. He's miserable. And he prayed unto the Lord and said, I pray thee, O Lord, was not this my saying when I was yet in my country? Now, we're going to begin to see the psychology of Jonah. And if you felt I was inaccurate at the beginning when I said he had hatred and bitterness in his heart against the Ninevites, and he probably had justification for it, and that was one of the reasons he didn't want to go, then will you listen to this? He says, O Lord, was not this my saying when I was yet in my country? Therefore I fled before unto Tarshish, for I knew that thou art a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness, and repentest thee of the evil. Now, I heard a liberal years ago at Vanderbilt University giving the Cole lectures there, and he made the statement that Jonah's problem was he didn't know God. And I don't like to say it like this, but the problem with that lecture was he didn't know the book of Jonah. Because it's very clear that Jonah did know God and knew him real well. And probably better than that lecture, I knew God. He says, I knew you were gracious. I knew you were merciful. I knew you were slow to anger. I knew you were of great kindness. And I knew that though you said you'd destroy Nineveh in 40 days, if Nineveh turned to God, you'd save them, because that's what you always do. And he said, I know what you'll do. Jonah knew God. And knowing God, he said, I hate Ninevites. I don't want them saved. I want God to judge them. So he headed the other direction. He said, those Ninevites, if they turn to God, God would save them. And you just can't depend on Ninevites. They might put up a good front. And they might say that they turned to God. And Jonah should have known that God would have known their hearts. He'd known whether they were genuine or not. And God would save them. You see, Jonah knew how merciful and good and gracious God was. Now he comes, and he's in great bitterness and anger. Therefore now, will you listen to him? O Lord, take, I beseech thee, my life from me, for it's better for me to die than to live. Now, I want you to look at this man, because two of the great prophets of the Scripture said the same thing that they wanted God to take their lives. In other words, they're actually on the verge of suicide. When Elijah ran from Jezebel, and there's another man running away, and it was unlike him. He went all the way to Beersheba, and that was the jumping-off place for the Sinai Peninsula. And he left his servant there, and he kept going as long as he could. When he's out of breath, he crawls up and under a juniper tree. And he says, oh, Lord, let me die. And when a man does that, and he's God's man, that man is exhausted, exhausted and drained physically, mentally, psychologically, and spiritually. Every drop is drained out of him. And that was true of Elijah. Elijah had been busy, and I mean busy, friends. He had withstood against the prophets of Baal, way up at Haifa, at Mount Carmel. He had been before the public. And this man, he loved the spectacular. He loved the dramatic. But it drains you after a while. And this man, when he heard that Jezebel is after him, he took out for the far country. And now here's Jonah. 
And I think you'll agree that this man has really been through the mail. In fact, he's been through a fish. This man has had quite an experience. And he's come into the city of Nineveh, and he has given out God's Word now faithfully, and the city has turned to God. This man is overwrought, overstimulated. He is exhausted, absolutely drained, and he wants to die. And there's one thing about this, and there are many of us, I think, reach this stage at times. We get to the place where we feel like, well, this is it. I give up. I quit. I don't want to go on any farther. And we're tired. We're exhausted. And to wish you were dead is just about as foolish a thing as you can possibly do. Because as far as I know, no one has ever died by wishing it. Now, people die of cancer and heart trouble and all other things, but they just don't die of wishing to be dead. And so he's wasting his time. Now, God speaks to Jonah. And I want you to notice how gracious God deals with this man. Then said the Lord, Doest thou well to be angry? And Dr. Young has given us, I think, a much better translation here. He has translated it like this is doing good displeasing to you. And that's what God meant. God says, Jonah, I have saved Nineveh because I'm in the saving business, and I saved sinners. And I wanted you to bring the message there of judgment to see whether they wouldn't turn to me. And if they'd turn to me, I'd save them. And they turned to me, and I've saved them. And if there's joy in heaven over one sinner turning to God, my, they must have had a real big time up there when Nineveh turned to God. And he says, now, is this displeasing to you that I've saved these Ninevites? And Jonah is in a huff, and he's pouting. Notice what he does. Verse 5, so Jonah went out of the city sat on the east side of the city. And if you'll notice, that's up there in the hill country. That is up in an elevation. And he got him a good spot where he could look over the city. Why? Because he didn't trust the Ninevites. He thought they'd go right back into their sin. And if they did, he knew God would destroy them because God never changes. And he wanted to be up there if the fire fell. That's the kind of man we're dealing with right now. And he's the man that brought God's message. And there made a booth for himself and sat under it in the shadow till he might see what would become of the city. See, he didn't believe Nineveh would stick by their conversion, their confession of faith. But he's up there and he's waiting for the fire to fall. Now, notice what God does. God moves in on this man and he's going to deal with this man personally. And this, of course, I think ought to answer the question, and we'll deal with that in just a few moments. Do you have to love people before you can bring the Word of God to them? Do you have to love a people before you can go as a missionary? Well, Jonah may be a good example to you, friends, in that particular connection. There's one thing for sure. He didn't love Ninevites. Now I'm reading verse 6. The Lord now is moving in on Jonah. The Lord God prepared a gourd. Now, that gourd was prepared the same way God prepared that fish. And if you don't believe in the fish, you ought not to believe in the gourd. I believe in the gourd. I believe in the fish. And the Lord God prepared a gourd, and he made it to come up over Jonah that it might be a shadow over his head to deliver him from his grief. So Jonah was exceedingly glad of the gourd. Now, Jonah is made happy at last by this little green gourd growing up. And every day, Jonah would go down to the Tigris River, fill a bucket with water, and come up and water this gourd, because that's a dry country over there. And he trained it to run up over his camper, you know. And he sat under the shade of it. And he got attached to it. Now, you must see the background of this man to understand him and understand a little about human nature. It's amazing how people can get attached today to living things other than human beings, especially if they're lonesome. If they have no person to love, they'll have either a dog or a cat, and even a vine. I visited several years ago some friends in Chicago, 
and they live in an apartment, and they have several plants there, and one was a geranium. And they took me over and showed me the geranium, and it's just a little old stub sticking up. I take my hole, and I have to cut them back here in my yard to keep them from taking over. And I just cut them down like you cut anything else. And this lady, she says, Dr. McGee, look here at this little geranium. She says, I know you grow them in California, but this is such a sweet one. It grows up each year and has flowers on it, and then it just dies back in wintertime, though the apartment is warm. I don't know why it does that. And I said, well, geraniums have a way of just lunging out at times growing. And that one hadn't done much lunging, you can be sure of that. A little bitty thing. And when I walked away, she patted, she patted that little geranium and says, you sweet little thing, you. And I thought, my gracious alive, does she talk to the geranium? And I guess she did. And she's certainly a very sensible woman and a very intelligent woman. And actually, she didn't have very many friends. Now, Jonah has no friends. He doesn't like Ninevites, and there's not a person in that city that he cares about visiting. And he's alone, and he's out of fellowship with God at this time, so God lets him get attached to the little old gourd. And I have a notion that Jonah would come panning up the hill with that bucket of water every afternoon And he'd say to the little gourd, little gourd, I brought you your drink for today. Can you imagine that? Well, people get attached to dogs. I took my daughter when she was just a little thing for a walk one evening, and we came to a corner, and there's a lot of vines there, and we couldn't see around the corner, but we could hear a woman talking. And I have never heard such sweet talk. And I thought we were interrupting something. And so I took my daughter and started to cross the street, And then a woman came around the corner. She's carrying a little dog, talking to a little dog like that. Now, I don't know whether she's married or not, but I'll bet her husband never heard her sweet talk like she was talking to that little dog. And you talk about some people leading a dog's life. There are some men that wish they could lead a dog's life and have sweet talk like that. Well, this is what Jonah's given his gourd vine. He's attached to it. Now God's going to move in on him. Will you watch this? And God prepared a worm. That worm's just as miraculous as the fish is. When the morning rose the next day and it smote the gourd that it withered. That worm just cut the vine down. Because worms just don't fall in love with gourds. They like to eat them. Verse 8, And it came to pass when the sun did rise that God prepared a vehement east wind. And the sun beat upon the head of Jonah that he fainted and wished in himself to die. Here he goes again, wishing. Won't do him a bit of good. And he said, it's better for me to die than to live. Now, in this state, God moves in on him. Listen, God said to Jonah, "'Doest thou well to be angry for the gourd?' And he said, "'I do well to be angry, even unto death.'" He said, "'The only thing that I had that was living I cared for was this little gourd vine that grew up here that you gave me. And now the worm has cut the thing down, and here I am all alone. Then said the Lord, Thou hast had pity on the gourd for which thou hast not labored, neither madest it grow which came up in a night and perished in a night. Jonah, gourd is nothing. Of friends, I hate to say this, but a pussycat's nothing. And a little dog is nothing. But a human being has a soul that's either going to heaven or hell. And the interesting thing is, God didn't ask you to love the lost before you go to them. He said, I love the lost. I want you to go to them. And that's what he's saying to Jonah. Jonah, I love the Ninevites. And should not I spare Nineveh, that great city, in which are more than six score thousand persons that cannot discern between their right hand and their left hand, and also much cattle? And God says, now I've spared this city. And what does he mean by six score thousand persons can't discern between their right hand and their left hand? He means little children. God says, you wouldn't want me to destroy that city, would you, Jonah? You certainly wouldn't want that judgment to come upon them. 
If you can fall in love with a gourd vine, can't you fall in love with Ninevites? Now, may I make this application? I used to say, when I was teaching Bible, like all the other teachers were saying, if you're called to go as a missionary, you ought to love the people that you go to. I disagree now with that violently, because how can you love people before you know them? Now, I first applied that to myself. I have never accepted a call to a church in my ministry because I love the people. I didn't know them to begin with. I went because I felt like God had called me to go there and preach. Now, I've never been to a church that I didn't meet the people. And many of them, I've stood at the bedside in a hospital. I've stood there when death has come. I've been at the graveside. I've been with them in marriages that have taken place in their families. And I can say truthfully, that I have never yet left the church that there wasn't a great company of people that I loved. And I really mean I love them in the Lord. But I didn't love them when I went there. didn't know them. Now, God is saying to a great many people today, God is saying, I want you to go and take the Word of God out to the lost. And you say, I don't love them. God says, I never asked you to love them. I asked you to go. I can't find where God ever asked Jonah to go because he loved them. He said, Jonah, I want you to go because I love them. I love Ninevites. I want to save Ninevites. And I want you to take the message to them. And I'm afraid that there are a great many people in the church today like this that I read. I guess I read this last time. That there are church members that are either pillars or caterpillars. The pillars hold up the church and the caterpillars just crawl in and out. And there are a lot of people just crawling in and out of a church today, waiting for some great wave of emotion, waiting for some feeling to take hold of them, and they've never done anything yet. God says, you get busy for God. I remember asking a missionary when I was pastor here in Pasadena. He was a missionary in Africa, and he came home and he showed me a picture of some little black boys that he had in the orphan's home there. And I could tell the way he looked at the picture, he loved those little boys. And I said to him, calling him by his first name, I said, when you first went to Africa, did you love the Africans? He said, no. He said, I really wanted to go to my people in Greece, but at that time the door was closed after the war, and I couldn't go, so I had to go to Africa. To tell the truth, I wanted to go as a missionary. And as he held that picture, I said to him, but do you love those little fellows now? And tears came down his eyes. He said, I love them now. God says to you and me, you go with the Word. I love the loss. You take the Word to them, and when they're saved and you get acquainted with them and know them, You're going to love them, too. Now, since Jonah wrote the book, I think it's reasonable to say that after this experience, Jonah left the dead gourd vine and went down where the living were walking the streets of Nineveh. And I think that he rejoiced with them that they had come to a saving knowledge of God. My friend, what a message this is. Why don't you get involved in getting the Word of God out? Don't wait for some great feeling to sweep over your soul. There's so many people that are waiting to be motivated by that, and that's the reason they're moved by things that are emotional. My friend, don't wait for that. Don't wait till you see a little picture of an orphan. Take the Word of God, because God loves them. And if you'll take it, I'll guarantee you, you'll learn to love them also. Until next time, when we go to 1 John, may God richly bless you, my beloved.